Thank you, Father, for Jesus, and thank you for what he's done on the cross. And we just pray that as we study here, that this message would be a message that exalts that cross and exalts the power that comes from it, the power to live a new life of righteousness by faith. And we thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so a light rejected from heaven. Um, in the Bible, it talks about a light rejected or a light from heaven. And um, does anybody know where in the Bible that might be mentioned? A light from heaven talks about light from heaven that was to be given. Revelation 18, verse 1, right? I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, and he comes down to lighten the earth with his glory. And that's what this message is going to be about, is this message of Revelation chapter 18, a light from heaven rejected. What is the 1888 message? Now, some of us have probably heard about the 1888 message and I hope most of us have, but there was a big issue that happened in 1888, and this is a, a way mark in our history. Let's give you guys a brief background here. It says, the 1888 Minneapolis General Conference session was a meeting of the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists held in Minneapolis, Minnesota in October 1888. It is regarded as a landmark event in the history of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Key participants were A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner, who presented a message of righteousness by faith supported by Ellen G. White, but resisted by leaders such as G.I. Butler, Uriah Smith, and others. And so this morning, what we're going to look at is we're going to look at what, what caused them to reject this message, because there were deeper issues. Some people say, well, we've accepted that message today, and maybe... They have, maybe they haven't. We're going to look at this and we're going to consider this carefully. There was something very deep that was to be considered in this message. Ellen White said it this way. She said, The Lord in His great mercy sent a most precious message to His people through E.J. Wagner and A.T. Jones. This message was to bring more prominently before the world the uplifted Savior, the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world, it presented justification through faith in the surety. It invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ, which is made manifest in, all, in obedience to all the commandments of God. Testimonies to ministers, 91 and 92. So there are several things here that it talked about. Righteousness by faith. It talked about the uh, uplifting of the Savior, the sacrifice, bringing Christ out. So that he was the center of this message and obedience to all the commandments of God. Because uh, in, I know it says in Malachi chapter 2 verse 9, you have been partial in the law. And is it possible that we may have been partial in the law? That there's things that we're leaving out. Is there something more that this message had with respect to his law? Ellen White also said, she said, when Brother Wagner brought out these ideas in the Minneapolis conference, it was the first clear teaching of the subject from any human lips I had heard. Expect, accepting the communication between myself and my husband, I have said to myself, it is because God has presented it to me in vision that I see it so clearly, and they cannot see it because they have not had it presented to them as I have. And when another presented it, Every fiber of my heart said amen. And so this message should make every fiber of our heart say amen. And as we look at it here, there's something that she said. She said they cannot see it. You know, the Bible says that the God of this world has blinded the minds of those who can't see. And there's something that they were to see. And when reading the Old Testament, perhaps they were looking back and not seeing something. They were blinded to seeing something. And so we're going to look at this and we're going to see what they could not see, but they are blinded. And, and what's wrong with Laodicea right now? They're blinded. Laodicea, right? They're blinded. They cannot see it. And that's what it says here. They cannot see it. Now it says here that an unwillingness to yield up preconceived opinions and to accept this truth lay at the foundation of a large share of the opposition manifested at Minneapolis against the Lord's message through Brethren Wagner and Jones. By exciting that opposition, Satan succeeded in shutting away from our people in a great measure the special power of the Holy Spirit that God longed to impart to them. The light that is to lighten the whole earth with its glory was resisted 
and by the action of our own brethren has it been in a great degree kept away from the world. Remember I mentioned earlier the light that is to lighten the whole earth with his glory. So what, what again message is this? It's the message of the loud cry. The message of Revelation 18. And it says, After these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. So if these men had this message, then they were giving the message of Revelation 18, which furthermore says that he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. It's called a loud cry, crying with a loud voice, and it's lightening the earth with his glory. Now, what is the glory of God according to the spirit of prophecy? She says the glory of God is his character, and it is manifested to us in Christ. Therefore, it is by beholding Christ, by contemplating his character, by learning his lesson, by obeying his words, that we become changed into his likeness. Now, she says that the glory of God is his character. So where there's a verse that talks about beholding. It's in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and we're going to look at this chapter and go over it a little bit as we go through the message here. But this verse is what she's actually referring to in the context there. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. It's a character of God message. So if we're beholding the glory, we're beholding the character of God. And it says, We all with open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord, are changed in the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So this is called the loud cry message. Now, if, if we have a veil over our eyes, we can't see the full glory, and we can't see the character, and if we can't see it correctly, then can we become changed into the same image if we have a false conception of the character of God? Right? We can't. So 2 Corinthians chapter 3, it talks more about this, and it says that this is, there's a covenant message in this chapter. It says in verse 6 that he has made us able ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. What's the difference between having just the letter and having the Spirit? If I gave you a letter here, and it has Ten Commandments on it, would that be any good if it was just written on a piece of paper? Probably not much good unless it was written in here. It's just a dead piece of paper. He doesn't want just a dead piece of paper. He wants more than this. He wants a living testimony. That's what it says in verse 3. It says, For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us. So this is a better ministry, a better ministration a more excellent ministry, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. If they're just written in a box, it's not really a real living testimony. It's not really a real living temple. He wants you to be the temple of God. He wants to put the law in here. And he doesn't just want the two tables of stone, but what was in the side of that ark as well? statutes which explain those two tables of stone right they were given to explain and define them now jeremiah 31 31 to 33 tells us behold the days come saith the lord that i will make a new covenant with the house of israel and with the house of judah this shall be the covenant that i will make with the house of israel after those days saith the lord i will put my laws in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their god and they shall be my people so this is the new covenant here. Is the law abolished in this covenant? It's not abolished. It's actually just put in the, in the heart of the person. Is this covenant with the Gentiles? Did he say, I'm going to make a new covenant with the Gentiles? He says it's with Israel, with Jews, right? So in order to, be a, to have the new covenant, you have to be a Jew. You know, some people say, well, that was for the Jews. Well, if it was for the Jews, you better become one because the new covenant is for the Jews. It's not for the Gentiles. The Gentiles must become. It says in Ephesians 2, who was before a Gentile. In time past, we're with the Gentiles. But now are no more foreigners, no more strangers from the covenant of promise. But you are become members of the house, the building. And he is building up his house, his temple, the house of Israel, it's called. 
So what is this message that was to lighten the earth? She says again, you know that precious light has shone forth in connection with the law of God as the righteousness of Christ has been presented with that law. Dr. Wagner has opened to you precious light, not new but old light which has been lost sight of by many minds and is now shining forth in clear rays. Again, let me bring you back to 2 Corinthians 3. If it's lost sight of, there's a veil over their eyes. They're not beholding. Now it's shining forth in clear rays. The glory is shining forth through these men, Wagner and Jones, the glory. And this glory is to lighten the earth. It's a precious light. And it has to do with an understanding of the law, the law of God. Because the law of God is a transcript of his character. So we need to have a proper understanding of that law. If we have a misunderstanding of that law, which is what is Satan wanting to attack all the time? What's the great controversy all about? He's at war with his law, his word. Now, Wagner presented, in, just so I give you a little bit of history here, winter of 1890, there was some ministerial meetings. And this was after the 1888 thing, but Wagner presented some things on Isaiah, the nature of Christ, and then finally on the covenant issue. The covenants were met immediately by opposition so strong that for a while, Wagner was forced to resign his position as editor of the Sign of the Times which is printing some of these views at this time. Ellen G. White, who was also present, urged that Wagner be allowed to give his views. Finally, 10 meetings were held in which to present views on the covenants. Wagner six times, Uriah Smith, others with opposing views four times. So there was some meetings that were held here where he was able to present his view because of what Ellen White did. But Shortly after these meetings, on February 17, 1890, Uriah Smith wrote a letter to Ellen G. White. And notice what he says here. He says, As it looks to me, next to the death of Brother James White, the greatest calamity that ever befell our cause was when Dr. Wagner put his articles on the book of Galatians through the signs. I suppose the question of the long Galatians was settled way back in 1856. I was surprised at the articles because they seemed to me then and still seem to me to contradict so directly what you wrote to J.H. Wagner. So these views were being put through the signs of the times and Wagner had to resign his position from the signs at one point because of some of this stuff being pushed so hard. And you notice how, how, how he likens this to the greatest calamity ever except for the death of brother James White. He thought it was pretty serious. He definitely did not agree with Wagner's view on the book of Galatians and the law. And I understand that the Bible says, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Most of the controversies that come about usually come about because the carnal mind is at enmity with the law of God, and it fights against the subject of being subject to the law of God. But I want you to notice the date on this. Do you guys remember the date of the letter from Uriah Smith to Ellen White? It was February 17th. Well, this is March 8th. This is only three weeks later. And she writes back to Uriah Smith. And this is what she says. She says, Night before last, I was shown that evidences in regard to the covenants were clear and convincing. Who was she shown by? Where's this light coming from? coming from heaven it's light from heaven here and it says evidences in regard to the covenants were clear and convincing yourself and others are spending your investigative powers for not to produce a position on the covenants to vary from the position that brother wagner has presented had you received the true light which shineth you would not have imitated or gone over the same manner of interpretation and misconstruing the scriptures as did the jews the covenant question is a clear question and would be received by every candid, unprejudiced mind. But I was brought where the Lord gave me an insight into this matter. You have turned from the plain light. So what is this message about the covenant question? It's called light. And you remember 2 Corinthians chapter 3? Glory, that's coming from heaven, right? And that lines up with Revelation chapter 18. It has to do with the character of God, as we're going to see here. This is what they're shutting away from the minds of the people. They're putting a veil over the minds of the people so they can't see. But what, is, what else does she say? This is a sermon that she had the same day. This is not to Uriah Smith, but this is the sermon she did on the day she wrote the letter to Uriah Smith. And she says this. She says, do not hang on to Brother Smith. In the name of God, I tell you, he is not in the light. 
Now, I tell you here before God that the covenant question, as it has been presented by Wagner, is the truth. It is the light. In clear lines, it has been laid before me, and those have been resisting the light. I ask you whether they have been working for God or for the devil. It is the clear light of heaven, and it means much to us. This is an important topic. This is not a minor topic, she's saying. This means much to us because the covenant really is about the promises of God. It's about faith. Can you trust the words or the promises of God? It's about righteousness by faith. That is what the covenant is all about. Now, she said this, and sorry, this, this, is, um, this is not from May, March 8th, but she said this. She said, we have nothing to fear for the future except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us in his teaching in, in our past history. So do we have some lessons possibly that we could learn from something that's happened here in the past? You know, in the past history of our people, the Lord God led us out of Egypt. You guys familiar with that history? And there was a way in which he led us out. It was by his power. And we're going to look at this as we continue here. But we should be careful because this is the only thing we have to fear for the future is to forget the way the Lord has led us in our past history. What happened to the Jews? They forgot the way the Lord led them out of Egypt in their past history. And very similarly, well, what could happen today is maybe 40 years more in the wilderness. Maybe we could be, uh, all die in the wilderness. Did, did many of our leaders die after this that didn't make it straight to heaven? Joshua and Caleb were the only ones that entered the promised land in that time. You know, because they had faith and they were righteous by faith. They believed in the Lord. They didn't look at the people around and say, wow, there's no way. But has anybody ever seen something like this? This is just kind of a, it's called a dispensational view of the covenants. On one side, we have before the cross, the old covenant. On the other side, we have the new covenant. And on one side, the old covenant is called the law. And now we're on the new covenant side, which is grace. This is called dispensationalism. It's a dispensational view of the two covenants. And this is what Uriah Smith believed. We'll notice here. The conclusion is therefore clear that these two covenants embody two grand divisions of the work which heaven has undertaken for human redemption and cover two special dispensations devoted to the development of the work. So there, he's got the two covenants here, one on one side of the cross and one on the other side of the cross. He also said that we believe there is better ground on which to rest the prohibition of pork than the ceremonial law of the former dispensation. If we take the position that the law is still binding, we must accept it all. And then we shall have more on our hands than we can easily dispose of. So this is kind of from a, the reason that he's, he's rejecting the health laws is because he has a dispensational understanding of the law and grace. He didn't understand that those writings in the books of Deuteronomy and the books of Leviticus were not just to be written in a book, but in the new covenant written in the heart. And we're going to continue here. We're going to look at the two views and contrast them. But that's the dispensational view. And there's a lot of people in a lot of churches that teach that this is how it is, that we, we're now in the old covenant now. We don't have to keep the law anymore. Well, Wagner had lots of light on this issue. And here's what he said about dispensationalism. He said, But as surely as Christ was slain from the foundation of the world, he was raised from the dead from the foundation of the world. So when was that? Slain from the foundation of the world? That would imply that he was, he was, he was crucified before Adam at, Adam, at the time of Adam. For he saves men by his life. Therefore, the Christian dispensation began for man as soon at least as the fall. There are indeed two dispensations, a dispensation of sin and death and a dispensation of righteousness and life. But these two dispensations have run parallel from the fall. Notice that point there? That doesn't sound like two dispensations running separated. They're running parallel beside each other. A man can at any time pass from the old dispensation into the new, Moses endured as seeing him who was invisible, and therefore Moses was in the new dispensation. So which covenant was Moses part of? The old covenant or the new covenant? The new covenant, right. So Moses was part of the new covenant. 
Wagner also said about the law, he said he never pronounced a curse upon anything except sin, and no one was ever cursed except for sin. And since God cannot change, the standard of right and wrong must ever be the same. Whatever would bring a man under the curse of God 4,000 years ago will bring one under the same curse today. So the Bible says, Cursed be he that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law. Is it still cursed today? Or is that little book of the law nailed to the cross now? And is it changed? Is the standard of right and wrong changed since then? Has anybody ever heard that teaching in Seventh-day Adventism? So what we have here is we have two views. We have Ellen White and E.J. Wagner, Light from Heaven. We're going to get into Ellen White's writings here in a second. But there's the Old and New Covenants. They run simultaneously since the fall. So a man could enter the New Covenant way before the cross up here. And we have the darkness, which is Uriah Smith, Butler, and Canwright, the behind the veil view, which is dispensational, old covenant under the law before the cross, and then dispensation two, where the new covenant is called the Christian age, they're no longer under the law. That's the dispensational view. And these two views, they do something to destroy the character of God. They say, well, God was kind of arbitrary back here. And he made you work at it to get to heaven. And he made you do a lot more of the law. But now we're free from the law. And now we no longer have to keep all those little restrictions. And we have a better dispensation up here. Is that the truth? Or do these two dispensations run side by side? It's what we read in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 371. It tells us that the covenant of grace was first made with man in Eden. And she continues here, but what's the covenant of grace? It's called the new covenant. Let's read a little bit of the context here. It says, The covenant of grace was first made with man in Eden. This same covenant was renewed to Abraham. It had been accepted by faith. Remember, righteousness by faith. Yet when ratified by Christ, it is called a new covenant. The law of God is the basis of this covenant. So this covenant was made with Abraham, with Adam, and with many other people back then. And this covenant ran from the beginning. This is Ellen White's view from creation, from Adam and Eve. And it's, I believe it goes back even further than that. I believe it's the everlasting covenant. And I believe it was made before an angel was even created. I believe that God and Christ came together and made a covenant that should, sh should sin ever enter into the universe that they had a covenant already in place way before that. Patriarchs and Prophets 371 says, Another covenant or compact called in Scripture the Old Covenant was formed between God and Israel at Sinai. But if the Abrahamic covenant contained the promise of redemption, why was another covenant formed at Sinai? Now, I want you guys to think about this here. Does the Old Covenant contain the promise of redemption? It doesn't contain the promise of redemption. It's an obey and live. It's a work at it covenant. It's do your best to try to enter in. This covenant is based on promises of God that you will obey and he will put the law in your heart and he will do everything. We're going to look at the two covenants here as we continue. But why was this covenant made at Sinai? What was the point? If the Abrahamic covenant was already there and that was the new covenant, why was another covenant made? Was it because God wanted one? Well, let's keep reading. But this is just something to notice here. It says, as soon as there was sin, there was a Savior. Christ knew that he would have to suffer, yet he became man's substitute. As soon as Adam sinned, the Son of God presented himself as surety for the human race with just as much power to avert the doom pronounced upon the guilty as when he died upon the cross at Calvary. So how long does that go back to where he gave as much power? Because some people say, well, since the cross, there's something better. We have more power. We have more of God's Spirit. No, God's spirit of love, joy, and peace has always been the same. He doesn't say, okay, here, you guys get more than these guys. God's not a respecter of persons. What are you doing to the character of God if you start to teach that? You're destroying his character if you start to teach dispensationalism. And that's why this message is a message about the character of God. A proper understanding of the covenants is very important to understanding and seeing through the, and past the veil just as Moses did. Now, Patriarchs and Prophets 371 says, in their bondage, this is why the, the uh, Old Covenant was made. It says, in their bondage, the people had to a great extent 
lost the knowledge of God and of the principles of the Abrahamic covenant. In delivering them from Egypt, God sought to reveal to them his power and his mercy that they might be led to love and trust them. There's just as much power back then. He brought them down to the Red Sea where pursued by the Egyptians, escape seemed impossible that they might realize their utter helplessness, their need of divine aid, and then he wrought deliverance for them. In other words, you can't trust yourself. Thus they were filled with love and gratitude to God and with confidence in his power to help them. He had bound them to himself as their deliverer from temporal bondage. So they made a covenant themselves. Here's what it says. The people did not realize the sinfulness of their own hearts and that without Christ, it was impossible for them to keep God's law. So they're entering a covenant here, not realizing it's impossible for them to fulfill it. So is this covenant going to be something that's an everlasting covenant that they're about to make? Is this covenant going to last very long? No, let's keep reading. It says, They readily entered into covenant with God, feeling that they were able to establish their own righteousness. So what kind of covenant was this? It was a covenant of self-righteousness, not righteousness by faith in the promises of God, is it? It says, They declared that all that the Lord has said will we do and be obedient. Doesn't it say it's by grace through faith and it's not of yourselves, lest you should boast? This is all that the Lord has said. They're making a promise of themselves to do what God promised he would do. They had witnessed the proclamation of the law in awful majesty and had trembled with terror before the mount. And yet only a few weeks passed before they broke their covenant with God and bowed down to worship a graven image. So this covenant, the old covenant, goes all the way to the cross and then it stops. Or how far did it make it? Only a few weeks. It didn't even make it a few weeks. It was good for nothing. What are you going to do with a covenant like that? It has no salvation in it. There's no way you can be saved by the old covenant. The old covenant promises no redemption. The old covenant is not about Christ. It's about self. It doesn't exalt Christ. And this is the message that Wagner and Jones were sharing. It's a messenger, a message that exalts Christ. A message that had the covenant. So listen to what it says here. They could not hope for the favor of God through a covenant which they had broken. That covenant was good for nothing. And now seeing their sinfulness, their need of pardon, they were brought to feel their need of the Savior revealed in the Abrahamic covenant. What covenant is that one? It's the new covenant. That's what Ellen White said. And shadowed forth in the sacrificial offerings. Now by faith and love they were bound to God as their deliverer from the bondage of sin, now they were prepared to appreciate the blessings of the new covenant. And what's the blessings of the new covenant? It's his Holy Spirit. He will write the law in your heart and in your mind. It says on page 371, 372, it is called a new covenant. The law of God is the basis of this covenant. The same law that was engraved upon the tables of stone is written by the Holy Spirit upon the tables of the heart. So you see the difference here? It's not the difference in the law. It's the same law in both covenants. The same law in the old covenant is in the new covenant. The difference is where is it written? Is it just written on a piece of paper in a book? Or is it written in the heart, the true tabernacle, his true sanctuary? That's the difference between the old and the new covenant. And a man can at any time go from entering into an old covenant to a new covenant. It doesn't matter what dispensation of time you live in. And that's the view that Ellen White and E.J. Wagner called light from heaven. This was the light that was to lighten the earth with his glory. Now, let's look at a few Bible verses and let's see how this comes through in the Bible. In Galatians 3, 16 and 17, it says, To Abraham and his seed were the promises made. That's the covenant. He saith unto seeds not of many, but as of one unto thy seed, which is Christ. And this I say that the covenant with Abraham was confirmed before of God in Christ. The law, Mount Sinai, was 430 years after. It cannot disannul that it should make the promise and the covenant of no effect. It can't change the covenant that was made with Abraham. So that covenant that was made at Mount Sinai didn't change anything. God's covenant is everlasting. If you break the covenant, is the co it's not a covenant with God. It's your own covenant with your own words. If it's God's covenant, the covenant never changes. The promise is forever. They're from lips 
that cannot lie. And he, when he speaks something, he makes it. He creates it. The covenant of Sinai formed 30 years later cannot change the covenant that was the everlasting covenant. So this covenant at Mount Sinai didn't really mean a whole lot except for it realized that it was their own promise. And that's what a lot of Christianity does today. And so we got to look and see a lesson here. And that's why God allowed them to enter into this covenant, to teach us a lesson that it's not of yourselves. It is by grace through faith and trust in my words. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Deuteronomy 5, 2, and 3 says, The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. He did make one with us at Mount Sinai. But the Lord made not this covenant with our fathers. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Did he make that covenant with the fathers? The one he made at Mount Sinai? Or are they two different covenants? There are two covenants here. There's the covenant with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. There's the covenant they made at Mount Sinai. The Lord did not make this covenant here with the fathers, but with us, even us, who are all of us alive here this day. There's two covenants here. One is a covenant of works, and one is the covenant of grace. In Galatians, we talk about the book of Genesis. It says it is written in Genesis that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. That sounds like a covenant of works. But he of the free woman was by promise. That sounds like a covenant that is believing the word, which things are an allegory for these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gendereth the bondage, which is Agar. So there's two covenants here. One Abraham made by saying, okay, all that the Lord has said, we will do. Me and Sarah can make this little baby here and we'll make the promise and we'll fulfill your promise, God, and we'll make it all work and make it happen. But the covenant of grace is that it's not of yourselves. It's a miracle. And it's by the Spirit. And so the child has to be formed of something out of something that is spirit. And so the second child, instead of being of their works and of their doing and their flesh, it was of promise that God created that child in the womb by his Spirit, not of themselves lest they should boast. It was by grace. So the covenant of grace is the one that was made here. And the other one is Mount Sinai, which is Hagar. They're the same. There's two covenants. Now, we see this covenant thing all through Scripture. It didn't just start at Mount Sinai because we saw that obviously they tried to do it with Isaac and Ishmael, but we can go back to the beginning where Abel, by faith, offered a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. If the covenant is faith and it's by grace through faith, then Abel must have been in the new covenant. And every other person that is in Hebrews 11 must have been in the New Covenant because those are all our heroes of faith in that chapter. So every single one of them was in the New Covenant. Abel, how about all the sons of God? How do you become a son of God? It's by birth. You got to be born. It's born of the Spirit. That's the only way you become a son of God, the sons of men, Cain and Abel. That's the Old Covenant, sons of men, born of the flesh, sons of God, born of the Spirit. Melchizedek, he... Uh, it says, without father and mother, um, Hebrews chapter 7, Aaron came out of the loins of all the children of, of Aaron, came out of the loins of Aaron. They were born of the flesh. Israel, the firstborn, you know, Esau was born first, but God said Israel is my firstborn because he's born of the Spirit. He's born again. Esau rejected the birthright, right? Isaac and Ishmael, born of the Spirit, born of the flesh, right? Their own works. Moses, remember we talked about um, E.J. Wagner, what he said about Moses. Moses was in the New Dispensation. Pharisees, you know, they said they were Abraham's seed, but they didn't do the works of Abraham's seed. And they said, well, we're born of God. God is our Father. We have one God, one Father, even God. They said they were born of Spirit, but in reality, they truly rejected it. And they were born of the flesh. And they were only... Abraham's seed by the flesh. So Abraham has two sons, right? But these were not the born of the spirit ones. And when we talk about birth, I know we go back to Galatians here. It says, but Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. Now, we talk about a woman that stands on the moon a lot of times being the remnant church. And she has some seed. 
or some children, the remnant of her seed. And the only way that you truly become part of this building or part of this remnant is by the Spirit, by birth. We are all baptized by one Spirit into one body. 1 Corinthians 12. It says the temple of God is the fullness of His Holy Spirit. It says that He's built up a house by the Spirit, Ephesians 2. It's not by any other way that you become a member of the church. It doesn't matter if you've been baptized in the water and your flesh has went down there, you might still not be born of the Spirit. And you might not be the remnant church. That's not what makes you the remnant church. The only way to become the remnant church is to become born of the Spirit. She is the mother of us all. And we become children by birth. And that includes Moses, Abraham, and all the people all the way through. It's the everlasting and new covenant. That's what she represents. This woman that stands on the moon is the new covenant. These are the two covenants, Sinai and Jerusalem, which is above. Now let's look a little bit more at Hebrews 8. It says, But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, a better ministry, by how much also is the mediator of a better covenant, which is established upon better promises. So this is better. What, what, if, the other one is, if this one's better than the other one is, worse, right? It's not a very good one. If that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. And where was the fault? Was the fault with God's promises? It says, for finding fault with them. They were the one who said all that the Lord has said, we can do. That was where the fault was found, on their promises, because his has better promises. He saith, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And I believe that's going to come at the second coming where he has all his people together. But the fault was in the promise of the people. It's not that he hasn't given us the promises already. But he says in Exodus 19, 6 to 8, Ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. Did Israel ever become a kingdom of priests, kings and priests? I don't remember one of those priests, Levites being a king. So it definitely wasn't all kings. Only one of the tribes became priests, so it wasn't definitely a whole nation of priests. And a holy nation... These are the words which thou shalt speak. So that must be the new covenant there that he's trying to give to them and the children of Israel. He's trying to get them to recognize their identity. And Moses came and called for the elders of the people, laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded them. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken will we do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. So there's a promise made here, but it's the words of the people. I have a better covenant which is based on better promises. It's based on the word of God. It's based on the promise of God, not on the words of the people, of us, right? So they ended up 40 years in the wilderness after rejecting this covenant. And Joshua and Caleb were the only two that by faith entered the land. They wanted to stone these two. And this is what happened. March 8, 1890, again, back to what was written by Uriah Spirit to Uriah Smith from Ellen White. It says, You have strengthened the hands and minds of such men as Larson Porter and Dan Jones, Eldridge and Morrison and Nicola, and a vast number through them all quote you and the enemy of righteousness looks on pleased. So they're all quoting Uriah Smith's words. Now she continues, she says, If you turn from one ray of light, fearing it will necessitate an acceptance of positions you do not wish to receive, that light becomes to you darkness and if you were in error, you would honestly assert it to be truth. So there's something over here that he's saying, well, if I accept this little ray of light over here on the covenants, then I might have to accept their view on the law in Galatians. And if I accept their view on the law in Galatians, then there's more on my plate than I'm going to be able to handle. And so we got to turn from this light on the covenants. I am forced by the attitude of my brethren have taken in the spirit evidence to say, God, deliver me from your ideas on the law of Galatians. Uriah Smith did not want to accept this light on the covenants because he knew that by accepting this light, he would have to accept Wagner's view on the law in Galatians. And what was Wagner's view on the law in Galatians? Let's read Galatians. Talking about Galatians, Glad Tidings, which is a book that goes over to six chapters of Galatians. He expounds on this book. And he says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Let us stop right here and contemplate this fact. Leaving the way of redemption for later consideration, we need to consider the statement very carefully. 
For some who straightway read it, rush off frantically, exclaiming, we don't need to keep the law because Christ has redeemed us from the curse of it. As though the text said that Christ redeemed us from the curse of obedience. Such read the scriptures to no profit. The curse, as we have seen, is disobedience. Cursed is he that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Therefore, Christ has redeemed us from disobedience to the law. Is that little book written in the book of the law, is that supposed to be nailed to the cross, as many are teaching? Or is it possible that it's supposed to be written in the heart? If it's a curse to break it, then what would we get for keeping it? Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they might have right to the tree of life and enter into the gates of the city. So this book might have some lessons for us. It says, if you diligently teach these things unto your children, they will not depart from the way of the Lord. It's a very important thing. Also, another issue he said here, that the term law of Moses does sometimes refer to the Ten Commandments. What is the law of Moses? Well, be evident. It's definitely the Ten Commandments, he says. Will be evident to anyone who will carefully read Deuteronomy 4.44 to 5.22 and onward. Joshua 23.6, 1 Kings 2, 3, and 4, 2 Kings 23, 24, 25, etc. See also Great Controversy, Volume 2, 2, 17, and 18, beginning with the last paragraph on 2, 17. On the other hand, the law of the Lord is applied to the ceremonial ordinances. For instance, see Luke 2, 23, 24. Thus, the term the law of Moses and the law of the Lord are used interchangeably of both laws. So the whole law is called the law of Moses. The whole law is called the law of the Lord. It's not... Oh, this is the law of Moses here, the ceremonial, and this is the law of the Lord, the Ten Commandments. Anybody who reads carefully will see this. And that's what we need to do is get in our books. The law of Moses is the law of God. God gave it to Moses through Jesus Christ. And he says, complete obedience is the only condition that meets the requirement of the law. God is not a man that he should lie. God's law is the rule of his government. He says, this do and thou shalt live but to the disobedient, he says, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things written in the book of the law to do them. By lips that never lie, the obedient are blessed and the disobedient pronounced guilty. So it's not saying, well, the book of the law is nailed to the cross here. She didn't teach that. She said there's a blessing to be had in keeping those things. She said the words of Malachi are a prophecy regarding the work that should be done preparatory to the first and second advent of Christ. This prophecy is introduced with the admonition, Remember ye the law of Moses my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb, for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. He shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Cursed is he that continues not in all things which are written in the law. Blessed is he that keeps his commandments. Christ has redeemed us for the curse, and he was made a curse for us. He's the center of everything. But if the law could have been changed, would Christ have had to pay the price? I mean, couldn't they just change the law a little bit and just kind of modify it? I mean, if that which was cursed back then could have been a blessing to us today, you know, we could have just modified the law. He wouldn't have to see. Well, this is what happens when reading the law is Jesus said, you have omitted the weightier matters of the law judgment, mercy, and faith. And so they miss something when reading the law, which is righteousness by faith. And God, Jesus called them blind Pharisees over and over again. Verse 16, 17, 19, 23, and 24 of Matthew 23. They're blind. She says, The light that came to me last night, it all opened before me just the influence that was at work and just where it would lead. You are just going over the same ground that they went over in the days of Christ. You have had their experience, but God deliver us. You have stood in the way of God. The earth is to be lighted with his glory. And if you stand where you stand today, you might do as quick, just as quick say that the spirit of God was the spirit of the devil. Do not hang on to Brother Smith in the name of God. I tell you, he is not in the light. He has not been in the light since he was at Minneapolis. Let the truth of God come into your hearts. Open the door. Now I tell you here before God, the covenant question as it has been presented is the truth. The presentation by E.J. Wagner. 2 Corinthians 3, back to this chapter about the covenants. It says, when they're reading the law of Moses, it says, their minds were blinded. 
For until this day remaineth the same veil and taken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even to this day the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. So what is the problem here, and why is there a veil when reading the Old Testament? Because they don't want to turn to the Lord. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4 says, If our gospel is veiled, it is hid to them that are lost. When you read the Old Testament and you can't see it, then you're lost. In whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So there's something that is light in those Old Testament writings and that they were to see the glorious gospel. The glory is to shine forth out of that writing. By beholding, we become changed in the same image. And so we have to see this glory in the law. But what does it say in Proverbs 29, 18? It says, where there is no vision, the people perish, but happy is he that keepeth the law. So remember what, what he is when he keeps the law. He's happy. And the opposite of happy is miserable, right? If there's no vision, he's blind. So if you don't keep the law, you're going to be blind and miserable. And that's what it says here in Revelation 3, 16, 17. This must be telling us about a church that is not his commandment-keeping people. It says, Then thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot. I will spew thee out of my mouth. Going to be spewed out. Because you say I'm rich and increase with goods and have need of nothing. I have the Ten Commandments. Well, there's more. You know, the Israelites had the Ten Commandments and the Lord wanted to speak with them more. And you know what they did? They said, oh, we don't want to hear your voice anymore. You go and talk with the Lord Moses. I think that we might be doing the same thing today. It says, we have need of nothing. Know us not that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Blind and miserable Laodicea because she doesn't like to keep the law. And why is she spewed out? Well, we can find out in the book of the law if we want to read it, and we still believe it's not nailed to the cross. Leviticus 18 tells us, You shall therefore keep my statutes and judgments, shall not commit any of these abominations, neither any of your own nation nor any stranger. Was this just for the Jews? That sojourneth among you? For all these abominations have the men of the land done, the people who weren't Jews which were in the land before you, which means this was definitely in place before Mount Sinai. And the land is defiled. And the land spew not you out also when you defile it as it spewed out the nations that were before you. So why are they spewed out? Well, I believe it has something to do with keeping his statutes and his judgments. And I believe that Laodicea is spewed out because it has something to do with keeping his commandments, his statutes and his judgments, keeping his law. The Bible tells us that this is the reason. We let the Bible interpret itself. You know, the message given to A.T. Jones and by E.J. Wagner is a message of God to the Laodicean church. That's interesting because they were blind when reading that Old Testament. But she continues here. She says, regarding Wagner's truth, she says, I have no breaks to put on now. I stand in perfect freedom, calling light light and darkness darkness, I told them yesterday that the position of the covenants I believed as presented in my volume one, Patriarchs and Prophets, if that was Dr. Wagner's position, then he had the truth. And that's where we quoted from today from Ellen White was Patriarchs and Prophets, a chapter entitled The Law and the Covenants. And she said this to Willie White and Mary White. She continued and she said, the law in Galatians is their only plea because they had this view of the law that was false. Why, I asked, is your interpretation of the law in Galatians more dear to you and you are more zealous to maintain your ideas on this point than to acknowledge the workings of the Spirit of God? You have been weighing every heaven-sent testimony by your own scales as you interpreted the law in Galatians. Nothing could come to you in regard to the truth and the power of God unless it should bear your imprint, the precious ideas you have idolized on the law of Galatians. So they can't hear, they can't see. But she says, the testimonies of the Spirit of God, the fruits of the Spirit of God have no weight unless they are stamped with your ideas of the law in Galatians. I am afraid of you. Isn't that what Paul said when they didn't accept the gospel? I'm afraid of you, Galatians 4, 9, or 4, 11. And I'm afraid of your interpretation of any scripture which has revealed itself in such an unchristlike spirit as you have manifested and has cost me so much unnecessary labor. 
If you are such very cautious men and so very critical, lest you shall receive something not in accordance with the Scriptures, I want your minds to look on these things in the true light. So remember, their minds are blinded. Let your caution be exercised in the line of fear, lest you are committing the sin against the Holy Ghost. Have your critical minds taken this view of the subject? Remember, he thought the question on the law was answered, and he thought it contradicted. He wrote this on February 17, 1890. What does Ellen White reply? She says, I'm much pleased to learn that Prescott is giving the same lessons in the class to the students of Brother Wagner has been giving. He's presenting the covenants. Since I made the statement last Sabbath that the view of the covenants as it had been taught by Brother Wagner was truth, it seems great relief has come to many minds. Lord's work needed every jot and tittle of experience that he had given Elder Butler and Elder Smith, but they have taken their own course in some things irrespective of the light God has given. By cherishing by failing to cherish the Spirit of Christ, by taking wrong positions in the controversy over the law in Galatians, did they have a right understanding of the law in Galatians? It says no, right? It says a question that many have not fully understood before taking the wrong position, the church has sustained a sad loss. And it lost much of what it could have used, which is the men like Butler, Smith, Canwright. These men all went their own ways. And they continued to push against the spirit of prophecy and the truth about the covenants. And this light from this day, I believe, has still yet to be accepted. But there's a book here that E.J. Wagner wrote, and it's about 600 pages long. And I didn't put a lot of stuff from Wagner in this presentation here. But this book is very enlightening. And it has truths that I believe have been hid from the eyes of God's people for a very long time. And I believe that it rips the veil off of the eyes with respect to God's covenant. And when you read it from the first chapter, you'll find insights that you'll say, wow, was that really in the Bible? And you'll go through it and it's just going to open eyes. And I believe that it gives us a better understanding of truly understanding what God has given us with regards to his promises and having true righteousness, which comes by faith, and also a correct understanding of his character, which doesn't change from dispensation to dispensation. He doesn't say this is blessed now and this is cursed now. He doesn't change his view on regards to the law. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And same with his law and same with his everlasting covenant. And any covenant that's not this covenant, an old covenant, the old covenant was not renewed in 31 AD. It's not called the renewed covenant. It's the everlasting. It's the covenant that was new and it's forever. Forever.